Um, at the beginning of the war, nobody knew what was going on or anything, and nobody uh, seemed to fight for the first six months. It's called the phony war, and people who weren't in the weren't actually flying on ops were furious, and I was on ops straight away, having trained and all that before the war, and um, and by the time I had my crash. Um, the war hadn't even started, but I'd finished my war. I'd done quite a few <laughs> trips on blenheims and so on. But it was so exciting learning to fly before the war. No rules, low flying, shooting around the place, chasing sheep and all that, uh, beating up your parents' home and so on. Even in blenheims, we used to, I, I read a letter from my sister at that time when I flew over our house, nearly knocked the chimney down, and my sister was absolutely thrilled. She wrote to me later and said, all the dogs in the whole of the neighborhood were barking, <laughs> and all the neighbors were furious. <laughs> but everybody did that then. We used to chase cars and put uh, night flying. I suppose one shouldn't admit this, but one would... <coughs> Night flying practice on Blenheim, particularly. Um, we used to fly down the Oxford Road and switch our landing light on and watch the cars dodging off the road. One did terrible things before the war, even during the war. But smoking kept me going through the war. Yeah. I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have not smoked. And uh, the sheer joy of eight hours flight. We all smoked, but never in the airplane, I wouldn't have lied. But as soon as we landed back, we all got together, lit up, and one would, and then go to debriefing, and uh, where the interrogators would have maps there, and they'd sort of, you'd point out with your own photos. Um, after, I don't know whether you knew this, but after bombing, you had to fly straight and level for about 20 seconds to show your bomb bursts. And um, that 20 seconds was all the flak was being poured up into you because the searchlights were all over the place was the most uh, <laughs> painful 20 seconds one had to do. But as soon as the, the blip went telling you that your camera had taken its picture, you'd go off weaving like yeah. that and so on. Did you ever drop bombs on other aircraft? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that happened once with us. Um, we could see the, against all the flares on the ground, we were usually at about 18, 20,000 feet, and the poor old Stirlings were down there, 14, 15,000. We could see them silhouetted there, and we had to rain our bombs straight through them. And uh, one day, um, we were bombing Kiel, a bomb obviously from a a Lancaster, which were above us, dropped through the nose of our, my aircraft and took off uh, my bomb aimer's leg below the knee. And um, he was screaming away and uh, we gave him a morphine jab. We, we carried morphine and you, you just jabbed it through uniform and everything and left it pinned in, and we gave him one of those, didn't stop him. So we gave him another one, and he was still shouting away. And uh, so we gave him a third, which was supposed to be lethal, but I thought he wasn't going to survive anyway. And um, of course, he's pouring his blood, and we wrapped things around it. And we got him home, and um, he was operated on that day 
to have his uh, leg still just below the knee. And he was up and around on crutches within six weeks. And uh, the surgeon said, well, you know you gave him a, a lethal dose? And I said, yes. And he said, well, you probably saved his life because he, without that, he probably would have died anyway. And Do you remember, I mean, my father got shot down over Texel or Tessel in Holland. The, the Dutch tried to hide him, but then he got handed over. There were Germans all over the island. Did you come down, did you bail out over mainland Holland? Is that where you, and you got... I bailed out over Holland and ran away from the area and um, was on the run for about 10 days, I think. Gosh. I was just ready to cross the um, Dutch uh, border into Belgium. And um, I was going that night and somebody who I was talking to um, said, oh, but you need papers, I can get your papers and so on. I said, fine, yes. I thought he might be part of the resistance. Yeah. Because um, the resistance picked up my Wallace op and got him home to England that way through Spain and all that. But no, he he obviously thought better of it. And the Germans used to bribe people, I think, give them a hundred marks if they could pick up a an air crew mm. and uh they shot him for it next week, according to my wireless operator. Ah. He was in The Hague at the time, and they said uh, they've, they picked up the skipper, and he was betrayed by a so-and-so they knew, and uh, we're going to deal with him next week. Would you like to come along? He said, oh, no. <laughs> 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 I don't think so. No, but they, thank you. They, they shot him outside a cafe. When I came from Dulag, I think most people did. Um, it was by train through um, or from... No, I, I went from Amsterdam. I'd been in jail in Amsterdam for a week and went from there to Dulag. And we went through Cologne and uh, by train. And uh, there wasn't a single building except the cathedral standing. So I said to I said to my two guards, well, we were instructed not to bomb the cathedral, but we bombed everything else. And it was, of course, incredible. There was one bomb through the nave of the cathedral, and that's all. And it was the only building standing there, way up amongst all the rubble. The whole of Cologne was just rubble, not higher than this house. Until you saw that, when you went on a bombing mission, did you have any kind of concept of, of what it was doing, no. or do you kind of cut off it? No, we didn't. And um, that's why Essen was continually bombed and bombed and bombed when it had been a ruin from fairly early on. But all the roofs of the factories were visible and you used to see them on the photos we brought back of our bomb, our bomb aiming bit. And um, they looked as if the factories were still standing, but they weren't. The roofs were on the ground. Ah. <laughs> so poor Essen, there were more bombing raids on Essen than anywhere else, I think. I went first to, I think it was Central Camp, and then after a few weeks was moved to North Camp, which was a much newer camp. And that's where we are in, in Block 110, I think, and the room I was in, whichever, had certainly Il Pa and Tolly and um, Wood Davis and... Uh, one or two others. I think I mentioned John Carson was in the next box. Well, in Marlag, we had <coughs> um, a weekly auction of um, um, 
one cigarette was one point, and that was the currency. And uh, we often wondered who ever smoked cigarettes because they were used singly to buy food and so on, uh, or in, in packets and that sort of thing. And um, we were told, it was all black market, and we were told eventually it would pass right through and get to Berlin when some high-powered general would smoke them or something. Um, they were worth one mark each <laughs> <laughs> by the time they got there. That was our currency. And uh, the next step in the currency were American D-bars. They were solid, dark chocolate, um, about um, that size, I suppose, and that thick. And uh, they were worth five pounds sterling. <laughs> and people gaily write on bits of paper, I owe you so-and-so 50 pounds or whatever. You know, and they were all cashed after the war, so I heard. And people would even buy watches from the, these early arrivals with, America, with uh, uh, wealth, expensive Swiss watches. They would buy those for several hundred pounds, that sort of thing. <laughs> Didn't you hold some rather unusual record for eating a D-bar? Yes. What was that? Yes, I held the camp record for <laughs> several days. Well, um, the American, the instructions on it, um, eat very slowly um, over a period of about 10 minutes or so. And um, the people had competitions as to how quickly you could eat a D-bar. And I thought I'd go in for this. And the idea was you would be given a D-bar and uh, you had to eat it in a certain under a certain length of time. And if you failed that, you would then have to give another D-bar to whoever took you on. And um, the record then was over three minutes, and could anybody beat three-minute record? And I thought I'd have a go at this. And I did it in just under two and a half minutes, I think, by crunching and gulping down great chunks of it. <laughs> I remember those Christmas parties. People used to use three months of their sugar and raisin supply uh, to make wine, fermented make wine, and then distill all that and make the liquor. And uh, some people put it through the still two or three times. The still was made of a trombone tubes resting in a box of water. And um, we'd boil the wine mix we'd made in a margarine tin, and that'd be boiling away and being, um, being distilled. made into, yeah. distilled into liquor, which would this be boiling away furiously. After the end, there'd be drip, drip, drip. <laughs> Trip of liquor and uh, put through the still three times as some did. They finished up with about half a glass full, and it was absolute. Uh, and we used to take the taste away with prune juice because that was the strongest thing we could think of. Still tasted awful, burnt with a blue flame, and, uh, and you get howling drunk in no time at all because we weren't used to alcohol and. Uh, it was one of the greatest parties was that first Christmas I was there. The next time, I think, it had been banned, I think. I only remember one, and uh, people roaring around, yelling their heads off, all of And the American camp, which was just next door to us with about a 100 yards of no man's land between the two, the Americans f had the same um, liquor, as, more or less, as we did, and they all got roaring drunk, no time at all, and came swarming over their wire, ran across no man's land, in, 
expecting to be shot, climbed our wire and came and joined us and pinched all the liquor that we'd left. The guards had been instructed not to, they'd put special guards on, not to shoot people climbing the wire that particular time. <laughs> Did the Germans ever drink any of this? Did they try it? <clears throat> I think I think we used to bribe them with, yes. If we wanted something particular, we'd give them a, a quarter of a glass of this. Uh, we were always bribing the Germans to produce various things, like all the wire used in the electric light down in the tunnels. Um, we used, I think, 600 yards of wire there out of a huge cable, which a, a goon had brought in to do some work, electrical work. And um, when he looked for his coil, it had gone and he didn't dare report it, so we blackmailed him <laughs> with the threat of exposure. <laughs> Poor chap. Were you a big theatre-goer? Did you? Yes, rather, yes. There was something we, we really looked forward to, and uh, they were so good. And um, about every ten days, I think, they produced a new one, and the German... Um, the, Commandant and any sort of <clears throat> high level German army officers who came along from outside, they would come and sit in the front row. <laughs> no, it was a great thing to keep up morale and so on. And um, while they were, I think they'd put on four or five shows, four or five days of one while they were rehearsing for the next lot, um, mm -hmm. rehearsing for the next lot. Did you, get, <coughs> did you get involved in the set, in painting sets or anything, being an artist? Or? No, I didn't. You kept no. out of there. <laughs> they no. didn't rope you in? No. Yeah. Well, they had plenty. Um, there were, after all, there were about 2,000 of us in uh, North yeah. Camp, and um, uh, so they, they could choose any type of occupation you could think of. There was always an expert there. There were people who taught classes, languages, or any language you could think of. People could learn it there. In fact, some people actually trained and got the... Uh, trained as, say, a, a solicitor or something, and took all the exams and became qualified out there. While in prison camp? Yes, yes. I know you went off and you joined the X group doing the yes, maps. Yes, map making. And yes. the code writing. Yes, Steve, in our room, he put me onto this and... Uh, we had a code. Every sixth letter you wrote uh, to your letter home had to be a code word. And that code word was chosen out of um, an Italian dictionary. You would find a suitable word somewhere that would fit in with the sentence you were composing. And the air ministry wrote to my parents and said, if you get a letter from your son, uh, which seems a bit odd, don't be surprised. <laughs> These escape committees were quite close, weren't they? And quite yes. Yes. Half the people didn't know what X was. Big X was Roger Bushel. And X were the minor... Uh, the leaders in each hut, I think, they had one X person. So if you wanted to, thought of a new way to escape or wanted to try it, you would talk to your hut X, who would, he would then go and discuss it with Roger Bushel. Mm. And uh, I think in Big X there were perhaps four or five of them, but Roger Bushel had an incredible brain. He... Uh, there were, after all, four or five hundred members of X 
Uh, no, I'm, I was. Yes, yes, that's right. Working, I was map making part of X, of course, and and um, uniform makers and tailors and all those people. Uh, they could build, or the tailors could create marvelous German uniforms out of uh, <laughs> any old bits and pieces. Yeah, we'd make a negative using indelible ink. And then we made a, um, out of a cake tin, um, which was about, the lid was about um, half an inch thick. We would pour gelatine and that made a, a flat surface and the indelible ink on the negatives which we made would smooth down on the gel and then you could take prints off that and you'd get as many as 30 prints from the one coating of gelatine. Who, who devised this? Well, we had experts in every line of occupation you can think of. Somebody devised it. Did you go down into the tunnels? Yes, I, I didn't like it. Yes, I did. Uh, only once, I think. It was pretty impressive. You went down a vertical, a vertical hole, 30 feet deep down a, a vertical ladder down one side. Down there was a workshop and that was the start of the tunnel down there. And uh, the workshop had uh, this pump which would pump air. The pump was made out of two kit bags and um, would pump the air down. And the tube was made out of cling Clim tins and uh, joined together, and they were laid down under the under the railway line. <coughs> the railway line was laid wooden wooden lines at about uh, a foot apart, and uh, I think we put tin. Uh, instead of steel uh, rails, I think we coated them with tins, uh, so said well, right? And um, there were two stations, Piccadilly and Leicester Square, we called them. First stop, you'd change train or trolley, and the first one would be towed back there by ropes. You get on the uh, middle station, uh, the, the middle rail to Leicester Square, get off there and then get on the last, which, the last run which was up to the exit hole and um, you've probably heard all about the <coughs> details of the escape. Yeah. What do you remember particularly about, about that evening then? That particular evening um, the milling and uh, all the crowding about in this one hut which all the uh, escapees were going to escape or try to all piled into this one hut and uh, everybody out else was coming out including myself because I'd, I'd been in there helping with, with uniforms and things and uh, then the um, the wait that night, nobody slept, and we waited and waited until I think it was about five o'clock in the morning, two shots were heard, we thought, oh, that's it. Because um, we'd hoped to get out 200 people and then close it up and open it up again a month later and get out another 200. That was the plan, but people who, with all the luggage they were taking, suitcases and all that, they knocked out some of the bed boards, the shoring up boards, and that created delays, endless delays, while it was going on. So um, only uh, 80 
one got out. Hitler got so angry with the, this mass escape because it tied up, I believe it was about a million Hitler youth searching for escape. The search went on, I think, for about a week, as far as I remember, tied up all these troops he had. That's when he said, shoot the lot, and they, he wanted to shoot everyone and uh, he was talked into just down to 50 in the, um, mm -hmm. as far as I remember, 47 or so came, no, 47, well, we couldn't understand why the first lot from Gurlitz, I think, was where they were held, came back to the camp and there was a long wait for many days before nobody came and we heard that 50 had been shot. And uh, morale went right down for many days. And was, that, was there any, was there anger? I mean, did people, was yes. there nearly a riot? Or? Tremendous anger, yes, yes. And it stopped dead all enthusiasm for escaping for quite a while after. The camp commandant was, was Lind, Lindauner, wasn't he? Um, uh, yes. Baron Lindauer. von Lindauer. Yes, that's right. He was a nice chap and he was most upset about this when he had to announce it that uh, 50 were shot while attempting to escape. They, uh, they, they, we found out later, they took them out in lorry loads of a dozen at a time and then they would stop out in the country somewhere for people to relieve themselves and they mowed them down once they were out in the, in the open. Mm. And that night of January 1945, when it, you were all turfed out um, on the march, on that yes. march to yes. Spremberg. Yes. Were you in the theatre that night? There was a play going on and somebody announced that they were all on the move in half an hour. And that, but were you there or were you in your hut? Or? I was in the hut, uh -huh. yes. Um, and that, I think, as far as I remember, was postponed and then restarted an hour or two later, I think. And of course, it was bitterly cold winter, snow had been on the ground for ages. People built sleds and so on. And uh, I think it was postponed maybe for a day because people collected everything they could carry. People hadn't got made sleds. You could only take what you could carry, and you toss it all food and and clothes and uh, everything else. I managed to bring my um, little carvings back because they were quite small, and I smuggled them. Um, have you have you still got those? I have, yes, in the corner cupboard there. So when you got to Marlag, um, you and Dad were in a hut again. Yes. So had, had you been, you must have been separated on the march and found each other, or...? <clears throat> yes, when you were roughly together, but the people who lagged behind, the people who were ill, like I was, dysentery and various things, you know, um, we were continually having to stop by the side of the road and do our stuff and so on. And then you tried to catch up but carrying all your stuff with you. So we tended to lag right back to the end of the column, maybe a mile or more back from our own bats, because the huts were meant to be together. Um, okay. But I, 
I don't think we ever caught up. There were one or two others, George Semper and myself, and one or two others, we were all ill. The worst march, of course, was that winter one. Then the best march was the spring one the next year. And that was sheer enjoyment, sleeping out under the stars. Pretty cold at night, mind you, under the stars until it rained and everything got wet. The sight of this, there was about this black line on the white snow and you could, from up above you could, over the hill, you could see this stretching way for nine or ten miles along this long black snake going right over the horizon. Astonishing sight. The cold um, was intense. The the first cold winter, my first winter there, was, I think, the coldest they'd had for very many years. Temperature would be 20 below, uh, going down to 30 below uh, at night. And um, during the March, even in the daytime, it was about 20 below. It was exceptionally cold and to try and, well, we had this first night in the barn when there was only a little straw and uh, 800 of us in this barn <coughs> would form piles of people. And we'd, we'd been marching for 18 hours, I think, and uh, everybody was dead tired. You got five minutes rest every hour on the march, and it wasn't nearly enough because people fall asleep in five minutes and shaking them up, had to get on. And all through this first night in the barn, there were heaps of people on top of each other, and the people on the bottom would eventually shake themselves out and get up to the top. And... Uh, it was only in piles of people that you could survive, really. Uh, everybody always wore all the clothes you got, day and night. Even even in, in Stalag Three, I used to go to bed with all my clothes on, including overcoat. <laughs> uh, pretty well every night. It went on for probably about four months or so, this intense cold. And uh, the first march, of course, was all on snow. The second march, there was no snow, so you couldn't see anything at night. First march, you could, because the snow was uh, bright enough. And uh, people shared sleeping bags and so on. Um, everybody made sleeping bags by sewing two blankets together round the edges, mm. and you could just squeeze two people in there. <laughs> and then you arrived, you went to Spremberg, got on the train, this awful cattle truck yes. train, which sounded horrific. That was ghastly. That was, we were, we were in it for three days, I think, as far as I remember. <clears throat> and um, people were very ill. I was certainly very ill. A lot of people being sick and so on, and we... We were locked in, and um, there wasn't room for... It was only really room for standing, sitting. Everybody wanted to sit down or lie down, but there wasn't room for that. So eventually the standing people sort of slumped down and people were on top of each other and all that sort of thing. And uh, it was bitterly cold, of course. You were up there in this horrific camp that had been condemned by the Red Cross. Yes. And that your story I loved with the... You had a lot of bed bugs. Oh, yes. And the Germans <laughs> gave you powder, didn't they? Yes. Bed bugs loved it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you, what did you do? You put... You made a little a pile of it or something? You... Yes, it's white powder, as far as I remember. And uh, it was... Luckily, it was only one side of the room we were in and I was on the other side and Pete too because we 
shared a bunker, two-level bunk, or maybe a three-level bunk, I forget now. And uh, so we were on the other side, and the people on that side all had these bed bugs. <laughs> that created a lot of amusement amongst us. <laughs> and was there an incident where you fed the powder or something you, in your book? Yes, we... Yes, because it didn't... The powder didn't seem to be doing any good. The bugs seemed to get worse all the time. Uh, so we put one or two on some of the powder, and they appeared to be eating it. <laughs> and then just wandered off. <laughs> There's one picture I'm, I just want to track down, that one. You might see the artist's name down here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've, I've forgotten that. Uh, yes. <laughs> It's a lovely picture. Did you? It seems that people used to pass these diaries around, and because there's several drawings of dads in there. Um, yes, because we did portraits together. Um, we used to have people queuing up for to do their portraits, and so we did dozens of them. Uh, we left them all behind because we couldn't carry them on our march. But. No. Did anybody inspire you, John? Leonard Cessa. He was my CEO at Linton on, when I was on Halifax's. And um, he would, he was, first of all, he was at school with my brother. And um, when I was in prison camp, my brother wrote to me and said Leonard had got a VC. So I told Leonard's brother, who was a friend of mine in prison camp, Leonard's got a VC, mild of so great celebration. So, did you ever feel like giving up? <coughs> no, not on the march, not in when you were ill in Marleg. Not really, because there was no way you could give up. I mean, you couldn't commit suicide, I mean, if that was the only way you could get out at all. But no, I, as far as I know, nobody ever thought that. Was there anybody that ever, that ever saved your life during the war? Well, I always reckon that Pete did, because he... My memories are rather vague, because I was very ill, um, iller than I'd ever been, and uh, he... he used to look after me, get me water. I just stayed in my bunk the whole time, as far as I remember. Mm. I was a bit vague about that first month in Marlag. But I was eternally grateful to him. And, of course, we had been friends before at Stalag as well. Mm. I look back on the whole war as being the most exciting time of my life. And... Uh, Life before the war was wonderful, of course, everything was so easy. And uh, I very often think, well, the, the whole of the war was the happiest time of my life, which is extraordinary, really. I think he did. He must have done, I think that's, yes. You might yes. recognise his style, or...? I do, I think. That's, I recognise Polly straight away. And, in fact, I you know, side view Pete, yes. Oh, there's Robert Neck. Oh, yes. These are awfully good caricatures. I recognise it straight away. It just did a slight exaggeration, but I recognise it straight away. Yes. <laughs>